uh, mostly that um, this is the session on public engagement with Antarctica in a changing world. The session is associated with the SCAR Action Group on public engagement with Antarctic research. And there will be another session to watch out for on Wednesday. Um, and I don't know it in your time zone. So um, let me just call back my, my screen. Uh, I have one other little piece of housekeeping, which is um, we're gonna ask speakers to speak for about 12 minutes and then we'll have the three, three minutes for questions. We have got a gap for a bit of catch up in the middle. Um, but because this is an international session and people are joining from all around the world and time zones, it would be very lovely if you could start your presentation, not only with your name, but also where you are, what time it is, what the temperature is outside, and say hello in, your, in the language of the country that you're in. And it doesn't matter if you forget all of those things, but I'll put them in the chat as well. So with that as my introduction, it is a real great honor to introduce John Weller, who um, would you like to share your screen and take it from here? Yes, I would love to. Um, I hope that you can now see a full screen, Science in Antarctica communicating with the public. Is that correct? We see it. All right. So my name is John Weller. Um, I'm in Boulder, Colorado in the United States. Uh, it is three in the morning. I believe it's still about 68 degrees because uh, we're in a, a bit of a heat wave. And, um, and if I am a little loopy, again, it is three in the morning. Um, but uh, it's an incredible honor to be here. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'm very excited to share my work and my thoughts about communicating Antarctic science to the public. Uh, to start, I have to tell you a little bit about my 18 year history in this endeavor. And it all started with Antarctic researcher, David Ainley. In 2004, a friend of mine thrust one of Ainley's papers into my hand, demanding that I read it right then and there. Now, as many of you may know, this paper on the screen describes the Ross Sea as the last large intact marine ecosystem on the planet. And at the time I knew almost nothing about oceans and the idea that there could be only one last place in the entire ocean left intact uh, hit me hard, it got under my skin. In fact, I was nauseous, I was angry, terrified, and I literally couldn't sleep. So I arranged to see David at his house in California and we committed to each other in that first meeting to work together to make a stand and call for marine protected area in the Ross Sea. And the first thing that I did was to read. David sent me back home with an armload of science and after about four months, I had read enough to start to write intelligently about the issue. I started to get some small grants and other support and I eventually got myself down to the Ross Sea to see it for myself. I had the honor of witnessing the power of the Southern Ocean and the jigsaw puzzle of ice that stretches out to the edge of your imagination. Adelie penguins exploding out of the sea and onto the ice like corks. Emperor penguins returning over the fast ice with bellies full of food and minke whales surfacing in the polinias. And the whole time I continued to read science, learning everything that I could about this magnificent place. Now, I must say that before 2004, I had never been snorkeling, let alone diving. So it took some work, four years and 600 dives to prepare to go under the ice. But that was necessary to hear the songs of Weddell seals and witness the other masterpieces of evolution, fish that make their own antifreeze, sea spiders the size of dinner plates, each creature supremely adapted to the unimaginable rigors of living in a sea of ice. Now, early in the process, I found a partner in New Zealand filmmaker, Peter Young, and later in Cassandra Brooks. And yes, she did become my wife. And yes, she is holding a toothfish on a research cruise in the Ross Sea. So maybe you can guess how that conversation got started. Uh, and together we formed the Last Ocean Project. Now, I, I wish I had time to pay homage to all the people and organizations on this list because each of them contributed some critical support at, at one point or another over the 12 years we worked on the project. But suffice to say, we had a lot of help. And by 2009, with libraries of 160,000 images and 250 hours of film, we set out to tell the story to the public. We published dozens of articles and each of those spawned dozens more. Over the course of the project, the images were published literally thousands of times. Peter's film toured the globe and my book was distributed to top diplomats. We gave hundreds of live presentations, were invited to speak even directly to the Camelar delegates. And we developed organizational par partners working in all the Camelar nations. 
Uh, in all, we reached a global audience estimated at nearly a billion people. And we took this obscure place at the bottom of the world and brought it into the mainstream. We gave it a face, we branded it. And by the time, uh, by the end, we had a million signatures. The Ross Sea was known as the last ocean and we had put Camelar on notice that the, that the public was watching. Uh, and combined with the phenomenal efforts of the scientists and diplomats, we helped to achieve an incredible moment in the governance of the Southern Ocean in the formation of this, uh, the largest marine protected area in the world. Uh, my wife and I were even on the floor of Camelar as delegates to ASOC to witness it. And this was 2016. And for the last six years, I've continued to work on Antarctic science communications uh, most recently as a series of short films entitled Science in Antarctica, produced in collaboration with SCAR to bridge the gap between scientists and the public by both highlighting cutting edge research and providing the in-depth context necessary to understand the importance of Antarctica to, group, uh, to crucial global systems and to peaceful global diplomacy. So my goal here tonight is to share a few key insights and to help, to help you all with your own communications about your crucially important work in Antarctica. And I'll illustrate those thoughts with some short clips from the Science in Antarctica film series. So to start, uh, I wanna point, point out that science, uh, Antarctic science is vitally important to everyone and it has the power to inspire. The fact that I'm here talking to you tonight, uh, 18 years after reading my first Antarctica science paper is proof. Uh, but to unlock that power to a, to a larger audience, we have to bring Antarctic science to life and demonstrate it as the life and death drama that it is. To illustrate that, here's a clip from one of the Science in Antarctica films, Retreat of the Penguins. My name is Stéphanie Genouvrier. I'm from France. I spent the last 20 years studying on pearl penguin because of protector aqua dire. If greenhouse gas emissions continue their current course, from pearl penguin would disappear by 2100. I think we can learn things or two from the penguin. This collective will, we must act now to save on pearl penguin and many species on Earth, including us. All right, now you saw some of that, uh, some emotion in that last clip, and I think that's key because science is often presented in a cold way. We must reveal that scientists too are, are, are human. And to further illustrate that, here's a clip of Mecha Santos from the Science in Antarctica film, Sanctuaries at Sea. And then in 2016, Camilla took a huge step and created the largest MPA in the world. I was there and I was in that room too when the, the establishment of this MPA was being achieved and this energy, this electricity in the air. And when all the countries were raising their flags, to say that they were adopting this MPA, were people crying and people giving hugs and, and I don't know, there was this sense of, of happiness and hope and they would. Oh, sorry. That reflects like story that, I don't know, is unique in the world. Hmm? You have the creation of an MPA, but the most important picture, it was about people. Agreement. That is the goal of an MPA, to have a common understanding. For me, it's that. It's conservation of biodiversity, but on top of that is understanding among human beings. I am in that map. <laughs> too. This, I am proud of that. Yeah, I am. All right, now in, in, uh, going further, in a more and more divided time, we have to find ways to unify. And Antarctica's story is rooted in peace and collaboration. And uh, I believe that that is a relatively unexplored opportunity to entrain people into the story of Antarctica. To illustrate, here's a clip from the Science in the Antarctica film, Peace and Science. Human activity in Antarctica was exploding in the 1950s at a time of great fear and distrust between nations. But instead of letting the Cold War conflict spill over into the Antarctic, the global community changed course and did something extraordinary, setting aside the entire continent for peace and science. And the global importance of Antarctica demands that we all continue to work together. All 
All right. Now, my final insight tonight to share with you tonight is, is that uh, uh, Antarctica's story is not about melting ice, at least in, in, the, in the public realm. It's not about melting ice. It's not about these incredible inhabitants. This is our story, the story of our struggle to become sustainable. And we must connect the science to this truth. Here's Tim Nash doing just that in Tipping Point. But tipping point as something that happens to the climate system that's irreversible on human time frames. Can't get back to the old climate state, not for potentially millennia. The one that matters for Antarctica is essentially the point at which the ice shelves are all gone. And that will cause very rapid sea level rise above the levels of the current projections. So the Antarctic ice sheet itself sits on continental bedrock. But the ice essentially flows from a high point to a low point, then it hits the ocean, and so it flows onto the ocean, it floats on the ocean, and we call that the ice shelf. There are ice shelves all around the coast of Antarctica, and what these ice shelves do is they hold back the ice flowing off the continent. Unfortunately, these ice shelves are all melting, they're all thinning because the ocean is warming, and in some places around West Antarctica, it's warming a lot. The last ice shelf, for example, the, the size of England, and it, it, it essentially disintegrated in a couple of months. Then what happened? The glaciers feeding the last ice shelf sped up 10 times. So we're seeing that happen all around Antarctica, and once they go, then there's nothing to stop the rest of the ice sheet just sliding into the ocean. Now there's another instability. So West Antarctica essentially sits in a big bowl, two kilometres below sea level. So that warm ocean nibbles away at the edges and gets into the soft underbelly. The edges of the ice sheet start to lose the grip on the side of the bowl. And so what happens is you, it's like a bunch of dominoes falling over. These ice cliffs just topple. And we've seen that in Jakobshavn Glacier up in Greenland. You know, it's an incredible thing to watch. These immense ice cliffs, 30 kilometers long, just boom. And if that really plays out at large scale around Antarctica, we're grossly underestimating the amount of sea level rise from Antarctica. Ultimately, the key thing is carbon dioxide warming the climate. And CO2, the greenhouse gases, and Earth's temperature are totally locked. We know from ice core records and geologic records that you have to go back three million years to see a time when our planet last had 400 parts per million carbon dioxide on the atmosphere. Here we have the Andrel drill system sitting here on the Ross Ice Shelf. We drilled back to sediments that were 3 million years old to answer that question when CO2 is at 400 parts per million or higher. What happened to Antarctica? And we know that the Ross Sea was 5 degrees warmer. The Ross Ice Shelf had collapsed. There is no West Antarctic ice sheet. And not only that, we know from other drilling projects that big parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet also disappeared. Global sea level records from around the world tell us that sea level was about 20 metres higher. So the Paris target says we must limit global warming to less than two degrees. And this is one of the reasons. It's a tipping point for the Antarctic ice sheet. Even if we achieve the Paris target, we'll get 50 centimetres of sea level rise in a century. That's baked in from the heat that's already in the system. 800 million people around the world are going to be affected by high tide flooding. And so, you know, Hurricane Sandy that wiped out big parts of Manhattan. Water is splashing over the sea walls at the tip of lower Manhattan. Those sort of coastal flooding events will be an annual occurrence. And we can't avoid that, that's locked in. So we've got to adapt to a living in a warmer world. The latest generation of ice sheet computer models are incorporating these instabilities predict up to two metres of sea level rise a century, unless we aggressively reduce our emissions. People feel it's a hopeless situation, and it's not a hopeless situation. In fact, 
The science tells us we still have a chance to solve this problem, get on top of it anyway, and, and, and avoid the worst. Just in the last few years, we were seeing a sea change in the world. It requires a global response, both in terms of how we save the climate and in terms of how we save ourselves. All right, thank you guys for watching that whole thing. Um, I wanna give a quick shout to, out to uh, my supporters and collaborators, um, uh, Mac3 Impact Philanthropies, Sea Legacy, Sender Films, Pew Bertarelli Ocean Legacy, Only One, My Home Foundation, and, and of course, SCAR for the incredible collaboration and support. And finally, finally, uh, if you wanna see all those films in, in uh, uh, their full form or give me any questions, please take a screenshot of this slide. This will get you to the YouTube channel and, uh, and my email. And I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you guys so much. It's been an honor. Wow. Thank you so much, John. What a powerful start to our session. I'm kind oh, of reeling. I wish there was time for questions, but maybe if you're able to stay with us for a while, I know it's 3 a.m. for you. Maybe if people have questions, they can put them in the chat to you. Yeah. Um, and could you put that, that YouTube link into the chat as well for people who uh, didn't yes. manage to grab it? That was just my one question was, was where these videos are available and how you're, how you're disseminating them. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, do you I'll, want to uh, just answer that? Do you want to just answer that quickly? Where are you? Where are you sharing these? So they're they're these are are been, have been meant as targeted pieces, and so we've we've been uh, uh, bringing them to different uh, places. Uh, we're going to be working with the Wilson Center, and hopefully the U.S. State Department. Um, uh, I shouldn't say that out loud, but uh, uh, working with the Wilson Center to to bring these directly to policymakers. Working with uh, the the NGOs that work on Antarctic issues to bring these directly in front of the public, uh, uh, short clips being disseminated through social media, uh, uh, using a, a variety of different uh, uh, influencers to as our conduit to a larger audience. So it is it's it's a a, a, a work in progress bringing these forward. But uh, you got to have the content first, so that's what we've been working on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations! It's really, really powerful, and I sh I'm sure that I'm not the only one here who would love to help you share that more widely once once it's out there. So, Thank yeah, so give much. us give us that link. I was just um, also filling a little bit of time because I couldn't see um, if Thomas, who's our next speaker, is had arrived. But IT have just told me that he does not appear to be here. But I'm just going to do a shout out in case you're masquerading under a different name inside Zoom. Thomas, um, who's the next speaker talking about, I really want to hear this one, a mysterious disease in Antarctic fish. Rebecca, you have intel. And I, I think he's moved to the Wednesday session, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that means we've, we've got a little bit of, is this where I, this isn't where our gap is though, eh? Am I looking at the wrong lineup? Rebecca, I think next we've, got, next we've got Sandra. Sorry, I must be looking at the wrong, wrong, wrong one. Sandra, apologies. I'm going to call up my info. Sandra, I can see that you're here. Would you like to, to share your screen? You're muted still. Oh, sorry. Perfect. Hello. Sorry for I'm muddling Sandra. my order. Yes, sorry for muddling my order. Sandra, welcome. Um, you're talking about books about the polar regions and their inhabitants. Have I got that right? Yes. Okay. I have I have sent my pre my pre-recorded uh, and I just okay. here for say hello. I'm from Brazil, Sao Paulo. Here is 6 a.m. <laughs> And the temperature, the temperature is about uh, 16 degrees centigrade Celsius. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I guess we'll just ask the IT team if you can hit play on that on that video and we'll have a little chat with you at the end. 
Okay. Hello, IT. Uh, there's somebody's raised their hand. Who's got your hand up? Whoever's got your hand up, feel free to ask, ask away. No? Um, sorry about this, folks. I'm just hoping that... Um, Uh, hello, IT team. Can you hear me? Hello, yes, ma'am. Hello. Have you got Sandra's presentation? Can you please play that? No, I'm sorry. We don't have Sandra's presentation, but I think she is in the panelist. She, she is. She is here, but she said that she'd sent her presentation through to you already to, to hit play on. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. I will check again once. I get it. Yeah. Sandra, we might have to get you to give a chalk talk as they were called in the olden days. Um, meanwhile, does anybody have a question for John just while IT is looking into this? You can put it in the chat. So that if if the video does start, we can move on. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I I needed a, a sign from this because I'm not prepared for it. Uh, and I answered the the organization two times by email and chat uh, because I we didn't um, have um, um, email to to confirm, and they confirmed twice. But I need to. To take because I I was traveling and I, it it is in my computer now. So <laughs> I, I I tell you what we um we have your video playing we have your video will play in a moment. Just give me one. It seems that they might have it. Otherwise, we actually yeah, have scheduled. They have. We have scheduled. A, <laughs> we have scheduled a bit of time, and so we can always put you in later when we've got our little gap. But. Sounds like they might have it. Okay. H Hello, IT team. Was that you saying you do have it? Maybe we should. We are playing your video. Oh, great. Can you play it? We're not seeing it. Hello, I'm Sandra Freiberger. Hello, I'm Sandra Freiberger Afonso, and I will present you my work with uh, Flavia Santana Rios, Silvia Dota, and Roberta da Cruz Piuco. Books about the polar regions and their inhabitants arouse interest of the juvenile public for these themes. Polar bears and penguins are symbolic animals of the North and South Polar regions. However, although thousands of kilometers separate them in their natural habitats, these two animals are often represented side by side in films, books, advertisement, and other materials that depict the icy environments characteristic of the Arctic and the Antarctic. This disconception is added to the scarcity of teaching material and children's literature aimed at approaching polar themes at school. In order to fill this gap, books 
were written for children and adolescents with the aim of transmitting more accurate information without conceptual errors and that arouse interest in the polar regions and what happens there. In a painful way, the fable The Adventures of the Great Papu addresses many concepts from the natural science, including the life cycle of penguins, the Antarctic food webs, web and the impact of human activities on tourism, fishing and scientific research on the dynamic of the environment. The idea for the book started with a storytelling activity in an extension project. The narrator is the Sorry, Sorry for the technical issue. I'm just replaying the video once. Hello, I'm Sandra Freiberger Afonso and I will present you my work with uh, Flavia Santana Rios, Silvia Dota, and Roberta da Cruz Piuco. Books about the polar regions and their inhabitants arouse interest of the juvenile public for these themes. Polar bears and penguins are symbolic animals of the North and South polar regions. However, although thousands of kilometers separate them in their natural habitats, these two animals are often represented side by side in films, books, advertisements, and other materials that depict the icy environments characteristic of the Arctic and the Antarctic. This misconception is added to the scarcity of teaching material and children's literature aimed at approaching polar themes at school. In order to fill this gap, books were written for children and adolescents with the aim of transmitting more accurate information without conceptual errors and that arouse interest in the polar regions and what happens there. In a painful way, the fable The Adventures of the Great Papu addresses many concepts from the natural science, including the life cycle of penguins, the Antarctic food webs, web and the impact of human activities on tourism, fishing and scientific research on the dynamic of the environment. The idea for the book started with a storytelling activity in an extension project. The narrator is the great-grandson of a gentle penguin named Papu. He begins by explaining the characteristics of this species. The book exposes the remarkable seasonality of Antarctica, associated activities on Earth movements and seasons. It all started on a beautiful sunny day, was already entering spring here in the south and the world and within the sun was shining again longer during the day, after months of darkness. The cold it was still strong, but not as intense as in winter. The book has a lot of information that allows the students to draw a food web from reading. Seawater that had even frozen in places, dropping the plankton, 
was starting to melt and was returning these organisms to the sea essential in the food chain. Has huge numbers of these microscopic beans were re released from the ice. They were immediately devoured by krill, a small crustacean similar to with a shrimp. With the evidence of food, huge shoes of krill are formed in these cold waters. An exciting excerpt from the book is the penguins running away from a leopard seal. They were heading to the place where every year this group built the, their <coughs> nests, as it was spring in Antarctica. On the way, they went feeding on the appetizing <coughs> crustacean, always on the lookout for predators. But just when one accepted it, a hungry leopard seal appeared with his wide open mouth, full of sharp teeth. The group of penguins got scared and they all scattered in different directions. After reading, students can represent the Antarctic food web through a dynamic using string. The guidelines are at the end of the book. The book also addresses anthropic action on the Antarctic environment, including tourists, fisheries, and scientific research, as well as the impacts of the climate change. Students can be invited to reflect on the fragility of the food web in the face of seasonality and overfishing and the whole of scientists in protecting Antarctic ecosystems. Another strong point of the book is the reproduction and adaptations of the penguins. In the book entitled Does Polar Bear Eat Penguin? This intriguing question is answered by professionals from different areas, such as biologists, geographers, paleontologists, oceanographers, meteorologists, bringing a broad view on the subject. Ice in Sign tell, tells a little about the navigators and the first encounters with these amazing animals. The author is biologist and teacher trained. Childhood Habits It's about eating, behavior, learning from bird and penguin parents. The author is an expert in animal behavior. Investigators in the aquarium Starting from children's curiosity, individuals in captive can teach us a lot about these animals. The author is biologist and science disseminator. Who came first, the bear or the penguin? A little about the evolution of these animals. The author is paleontologist. Energy so to survive in the cold. Metabolism and adaptations of bears and penguins. The author is Antarctic bird a researcher. Evolution and adaptations to climate change. How these animals cope with past and present change. The author is an oceanographer. In the land of penguins, birds hang. Geography and species extinction. The author is a geographer. The supposed meeting of bears and penguins. With climate change, could they be able to Across the equator. The author is a meteorologist. After all, what is the carnivore? About prey and predators. The author is zoologist and ecologist. What do expert swimmers do on dry land? About habitats and camouflage. The author is a biologist expert in penguins. 
change in the climate? What changes in food? What will the future of polar animals look like? The author is a marine biologist. Two poles, many differences. What can we conclude? The author is a glaciologist. Uh, the digital version of the books in Portuguese can be accessed free of charge at, at uh, web site of uh, interantar.com. The website is here on the screen, interantarica.com, livros, that means books in Portuguese. In addition to contributing the, to dissemination of science, these books will provide pedagogical support with scientific rigor to teachers, uh, addressing various aspects of the polar regions and their influences on the planet and the classrooms. And then here is the addresses that when you can find us in at uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and here is my Instagram, my personal Instagram, and my email address addresses. Uh, I thank you all of you for listening to me, even without having uh, perfect English. Um, I hope you have understood and enjoyed our work. Thank you. Have a nice meeting at this car. And see you. Oh, wow. Sandra, what a beautiful presentation. I would love to hold those books in my hand. They look incredible. Sandra, if I can, it looks like you're you're still here. Oh, good. Thank you for, thank you so much for sharing that and, and, and uploading that. Um, does anyone have any, any questions or comments? I'm quite moved by the, um, by the depth of content that you cover in that. Um, but Jose, I can see you have a hand up. Yeah, is uh, first to parabéns, Sandra. <laughs> Thank you. You <laughs> are one of our uh, writers. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's so great to see. I, I I totally agree with Rianne. Is the work that you've been doing in Brazil is impressive, and in bringing the scientists to actually improve their communication skills is something that we need to promote. But also, you link very well with the schools, and, and you're doing this very well. I just want to make sure because by asking this question, the following question also can provide a role model for others is, I presume that all your books have been validated by the scientists. All the information that includes in the books are validated yes. by your own Brazilian scientists and colleagues, right? Yeah, all right. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we... We ask uh, some of uh, scientists to to review, uh, and uh, it brings us um, more accurate to to uh, yeah. speaking at schools right, the mm -hmm. subjects. And okay, because it's so important to make sure that what we have in the books. And also have the educators helping the scientists actually how to communicate. So it's just not one way. It's not just the scientists validating. It's actually the educators helping the scientists. So working together, I think what you're doing in Brazil is is, is amazing. One tiny yes. final. Oh, sorry, John. You have a question? No. Okay. I just have a small question. That is also a challenge that we have today. Is how has been your efforts in bringing these books to be used in schools and possibly used or get into the curriculum in Brazil to be officially in schools? It, has it been possible or not? Uh, we are working uh, to, to 
to insert, I, I, my English is awful. Uh, I prefer to speak in Portuguese if you but yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, no, so, you're trying, so you're trying to put the curriculum into the official curriculum of Brazil in terms of education yes, yes. at the moment. You're trying, okay. Yes. No, that's great. We try. Okay. <laughs> So I can, I can because Brazil is a, a, a very big uh, country. We have uh, one particular curriculum is in uh, the all nature. It is very difficult to insert some new team, but we are trying to do this. We are working about it. Okay. Thank you. But it, <laughs> Sandra, there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions and comments. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but we have a chat area and we also have a Q&A area so that people who are not presenting, it seems they can't write in the chat area, but they can write in the Q&A area. So there are quite a lot of questions and comments in there. Hopefully you can find them. Somebody's asking about if the uh, books are available for free or if they're in an e-format. -for yes, yeah, um, I, I, I write Maybe the... you can, yeah. Maybe you can write into the chat there so that they yes, can. Yes, I can um, write. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. That was just inspiring. I'm I'm loving this session. Um, Francine, I think I figured out who you are from your Zoom name. Do you want to turn your? Yeah, there you are. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Yeah. Morning. Where are you joining Bom us? Good dia, Jose. <laughs> Bom dia. <laughs> Uh, hello where, where, are you, where are you joining us from i'm from brazil uh sao paulo it's a rainy day just scar to get up <laughs> just scar to to take me off the 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 my my room because it's so it's so cold today <laughs> but it's an all an all an honor to stay here. Do you, do you nice. have, have you uploaded a presentation or will no, you no. present now? I, your share screen? I, I will present now. Great. The floor is yours. Great. Well, I will tell you about the certifying institution, institutions that develop the Antarctic Mindset, Antarctic Accreditation STEM. It's a work with uh, Silvia Dota and Alfredo Soto. Silvia Dota is from Brazil too, and Alfredo Soto is from Chile. We, we work with APEX, from many years. And then we went to the schools and make the and gave the lecture work about the Antarctic team. But uh, after that, nobody talk about this anymore. You know? And then like Sandra told, it's Antarctica, it's so important but it's not on the basic curriculum. It's not on the books. Yeah, even in many other countries, not in Brazil, not so in Brazil, just in Brazil or Chile, but in many other countries. And in Brazil, it's very difficult because the language, it's a difficult uh, too, because we have, some materials in English and not in Portuguese. And here the English language, it's, it's difficult for us <laughs> researchers, imagine to the students. Then we, we try to bring something that put all the school teachers, students uh, to work and study Antarctica. Then the Antarctic Accreditation STEM is a certification granted to schools, museums, 
or other institutes that include Antarctic knowledge and culture at day-to-day -day activities. The certification serves to demonstrate to, institute, to institutions their performance and concern for the Antarctic environment. Then in 2013, the, uh, the Selo Antártico, that we call in Portuguese, what has been created on Gaia Antarctic Research Center from University of Magalhães. Uh, then Alfredo worked with many activities uh, and uh, he went to the schools and worked there for two, day, two years with different activities. And after two years, the school received one stamp. No? Uh, and uh, he proposed uh, participation on International Polar Week, uh, Antarctic Day, and another other activities like the, the dome, expositions, TV program, a trip on, um, on Punta Arenas or other, other uh, locals with ice, you no? Know? And then in 2021, we bring this concept to Brazil. Me, with the Institute, Gelo na Bagage Institute, and Interantar, Silvia with Interantar. Then we propose many activities on the school, and the one year of activities, one stamp. One year more, another stamp. And then um, the school can make, uh, can participate on International Polar Week to Antarctic Day. We make we made online courses and activities with videos about Antarctica. And the school, uh, the, the activities add points to the school. And after that, the school received one, one of the five certifications. 150 points, Agento Pinguim, Agento Pinguim, 300 points, Adele Penguin, until 600 points, Emperor Penguin. Then 600 points, we need all the school work with Antarctic 10. Then we make different materials to support that activities. Then uh, Gelo na Bagagem Institute uh, has online course on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, a site with blog. Uh, there is a poster, a new poster here about Gelo na Bagagem. And uh, sometimes some videos on YouTube, there is a subtitled, but it's very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult to make alone and bring all the, the, the language. And then the, the aim is bring materials in Portuguese. In fact, uh, like Interantar, there, is, there are many materials now online courses, YouTube, YouTube with uh, subtitles, English and Spanish, audio books, books and e-books that Sandra presented, podcasts, TikTok, games, and all the things uh, you, can, you can see on site, internet our site. And next presentation, Silvia will will tell more about these materials. And there are many e-posters about uh, Interantar. Then after this, the school can make 
all the different activities that use the creativity and use the videos, uh, make online lectures, present, present lectures, uh, drawing and poetry, book, an Instagram made by students, theater from the late students to the early students, activities on the neighborhood, uh, talking about uh, ocean, paint and sculpture, and uh, their own polar week. Well, then the school could make all many activities to, to uh, receive the, the stamp. Then since it, in 2013 in Chile, uh, 15 schools received the Celo, Celo Antarctico Chileno, the Chilean stamp. Uh, the first school in Punta Arenas, Chile, and after we have in Spain, here in Brazil, Peru, Portugal, and uh, Argentina. And then, in 2021, we in Brazil, uh, eight school received the Selo Antártico Brasileiro, the Brazilian stamp. In fact, seven Brazilian schools and one Brazilian, one Portugal school. Oh, then um, this Portugal school received the second stamp and uh, three Brazilian school received the second stamp and uh, four schools, Brazilian schools received the first stamp for this first year with the Selo Antártico Brasileiro. Uh, for now, 2022, we have more than a hundred schools uh, trying the, the STEM. And then we have Brazilian schools, Portugal schools, and one Greek, Greek school trying to, to receive the STEM. To Greek school, we are using the videos with subtitles and uh, talk with the teacher to make others activities and use the creativity. Then we hope the science dissemination action can contribute to the formation of the Antarctic mentality in society and bring Antarctic theme to our day to day and our community. Thank you. Oh, so wonderful. I can feel your enthusiasm coming through the screen. <laughs> That's absolutely incredible amount of um, energy and work and, um, and school children who you're reaching with this work. Just um, um, amazing. Uh, I, just before we take a question or a comment, I, I, I figured the next person up is your colleague, Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, do you want to start getting your presentation ready just so that we can catch up on our time a little bit? Um, and uh, does anybody have a, a question for Francine or a, or a comment? I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly there. How do I say your name? Francine. Francine, okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Fran uh, is the character on Gelo na Bagagem. <laughs> Because okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I kind of guessed you were from your name. That was probably you, but I didn't want to assume. Um, uh, there are there are some other comments in the, the Q and A as well. Just just so you all know, um, there is a space where everyone who's watching this Zoom can talk, which is comes up as the Q and A. And I, I have a feeling that those people are not seeing the chat area, which just the panelists are seeing. So. That's to the panelists, don't send messages to people in the chat, if you, I think, if you want them to see it. Um, any, any questions or comments? 
Jose and John. We'll start with Jose. I will, I will, I will just very quick because Pia had a, a good point. To, how could uh, Francine, primeiro, parabéns. <laughs> Muito bom. Uh, it was the question how, how can you advertise this initiative uh, in, in the schools? Do you have a mechanism working directly with the Ministry of Education in Brazil? Or are the schools that know you because now you're a famous person, so they'll contact you directly to, to join the, the program? Many of the schools came from the online course, the online course of Silvia, uh, Antarctica or Antarctica, and my online course, uh, and person by person, right now, until now. We want a uh, financial or <laughs> patrocinio, how, 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 how can I it's say that? Also. Yes. Yeah, we we need to to make more activities and more materials in different languages too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Impressive. Um, just a quick shout out uh, to the IT team because I'm not sure if you see my my text. Is anyone from the IT team there? Yes. Hi. Hi. Sylvia is our next speaker. She's going to be starting her session in four minutes and she has sent you a video in advance. Would you be able to um, look for that, please? And the rest of us on this uh, Zoom call. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so look, I, I think this chat could keep going on. I'm so excited and I'm excited to hear about your collaboration. But I know that we also promised everyone a 15 minute break, but instead of that, I'm going to give you a three minute break. <laughs> so hold that. Oh, great. Thank you, IT team. But hold that thought. Don't hit play yet. Uh, we're going to come back in three minutes. So that's time to get a, a glass of water or have a stretch. And then we'll be back on time again. So thanks, everyone. Okay. Francine, while we're on break. Hi, it's John Weller calling. Hi. <laughs> hey, um, do you have, are there, is there, uh, you were saying that you need funding to get, get things done in, in other languages, but um, is there a way to uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, learn about that if you do make those materials in different languages? We'd love to I'd love to bring it to my kids' elementary school, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> so um, I just have a personal interest in bringing those stories here. So. Yes. Yeah, but uh, from Greece, for example, she worked with the Portugal teachers. And then uh, she, she wants the, the stamp. And we, we have... Mm, not so many materials in English for her. Then, right, right. Uh, we we want to make a different language too. The, is, is is there is there a website or or some some way? So in the future, if if you if you do produce more English materials, that I might be able to access them. Ah, uh, yes, but. I don't know when. <laughs> I don't know oh, when, sure, but, yeah, no. <clears throat> but we, uh, the material that we have, there is on site of Interantar, and uh, I have mine, the Gelo na Bagagem. I will put on the chat. Great, thank you. Gelo na Bagagem is uh, ice in the luggage in Portuguese. <laughs> awesome. Well, welcome back, everyone. That was your three-minute moment. 
Um, uh, to the IT team, could you please load the video? And Sylvia, before they uh, start playing, do you want to just tell us where you are and, um, and what the time is and how cold or warm it is? Okay. Hello, everyone. Morning. I am in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, now it's 7 4. It's early. It's time to get up. <laughs> And it's about 16 degrees up uh, Celsius outside. And I, I will mute my mic. Great, thank you. Please press play on that and we'll talk to you at the end. Hello, everyone. My name is Silvia Dota. I am from Brazil. I will present the one-on-one one -on -one questions about the Polar Regions Transmedia, an outreach project created by my colleagues Fabiana Costa, Francine Elias Pieira, Manu Bassoi, Vanessa Carmo, Tiene Pelosi, and me from Interantar at the Federal University of ABC. Antarctica and Arctic are not topics usually presented in the Brazilian curriculum. Furthermore, because of this, teaching about polar regions is a big challenge. First, the National Curricular Common Base is a document with 600 pages, and Antarctica is cited only once in the skills for eighth grade in geography. Because of this, the textbooks bring only four or six pages referencing Antarctica with a few topics. On the other hand, we believe that teachers do not have enough knowledge to introduce polar regions in the classroom. To change this situation, since 2014, we offer a distance learning course for teachers about how to introduce Antarctica in classroom. So, we conducted a survey with teachers to understand that they know or do not know about Antarctica. The survey with 15 questions was applied before and after teachers attend an Antarctica training course. One hundred thirty-eight teachers answered the questionnaire. And as we as you can notice, there were many wrong answers before they took the course. However, they could improve their knowledge during the course. So, in previous research, we concluded that offering a wide range of materials on polar regions is necessary to bring Antarctica and Arctic sciences to teachers, students, and non-specialized audiences. Let's go back in time a little. In 2013, we launched the Interantar program creating many ways to bring polar science to schools and the general public. We conducted the first live from Antarctica to Brazil. We created the Antarctica or Antarctica course. We have already offered this course nine times. We produced more than 250 scientific videos and podcasts. We brought Antarctica to many classrooms with the Polar Cast Casters project. We also published books and produced video games and simulations. Some of these projects are being presented in this event as well. In 2022, we started the Transmedia project. In the beginning, we wrote some books and then we created other media with the same subject. 
Furthermore, we are working in other media in the future. For example, the 101 questions about the polar regions transmedia is offered in a book, a TikTok series, an audiobook, and an Instagram series. Let's watch a few seconds of a video from TikTok. Ai, que água gelada! O que, que podia fazer um calorzinho, né? Tipo, aquecimento local? Hum, Georgia, você por acaso sabe como as ações das pessoas interferem nas mudanças climáticas? Começa agora! O seu, o meu, o nosso! Cento e uma pergunta sobre regiões polares. Outro dia eu acompanhei uma situação curiosa. Eu até fotografei com o meu pinguim fone 7x. Tinha os pesquisadores bem ali no fundo, eles estavam removendo um pedaços de gelo. Falaram que iam analisar tudo o que está acontecendo no mundo desde épocas passadas. Inclusive a emissão de gases de efeito estufa. Como é que isso é possível? Derretendo esse material, microbolhas de gases são liberadas e é possível analisar quais são eles e em que quantidades estavam na atmosfera em determinada época, como o dióxido de carbono, o CO2. O efeito estufa funciona como um obstáculo para a dissipação da radiação infravermelha, aumentando a temperatura global. Um... E de onde vêm esses gases? Quem está produzindo isso? Hum, na realidade, este é um processo natural. Well, in conclusion, we can say that applying different media to communicate science expands the scientific narrative. The diversity of languages fosters a better understanding of the themes by different audiences. Transmedia narratives improves the reach of diver diverse audiences. So thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to get in touch with me. See you soon. Thank you. How fantastic. Well, between you and Francine, you, you're taking over Brazil, as far as I can tell. That's some enormous reach and, and what, a, what fantastic quality as well. I feel like I'm doing all the speaking here. If there are other people who have comments or questions, Oh, John, is your hand up for this one, or is that a carryover? Oh, great. What, 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 what's your comment or question, John? Oh, yeah. Well, first off, Sylvia, fantastic work. I love the TikTok angle. Um, I think I'm going to, I may steal that. I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I did have a question. I, I, that graph or, or the, the uh, data that you put up for uh, people's understanding uh, before and after the course. I, I don't know if I read it correctly because it was up there quickly, but it seemed like there were some questions where there was a significant number of people who, who had worse understanding after the course. Do you have any insight on that? Like what, what was the, that, that would be really interesting to know is, is how, how the course failed in those specific um, situations. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, first of all, it is important to know that in our course, uh, our course is not a, a contest, uh, how can I say? It's a, a, we teach a proceeding, proceeding way, you know, uh, how to get in touch with Antarctica. It's a not content course. So, we, we create 15 statements, some of them we teach in the course and some of them we don't teach. For example, we don't talk about uh, where penguin and polar bears live. 
So they have to find out in, in other places, uh, researching or studying to create their classes because our course is for teachers, okay? So one of the statements is about where do they live? And so first of all, usually people say they live together, they don't know where they live or they just answer at the South Pole or the North Pole. Uh, and there are questions that there are a, a few minutes that they, they are wrong. So this is one of them. And there are, uh, for example, about the Brazilian station. And so it's uh, around, I can send you the, the I have all of them uh, in English and you can, uh, you can get in touch with the answers and understand what we do. Wonderful, thank you. Um, just before we take the next question, Sonia, you're next up. Um, could you just let me know in the chat um, if you will be speaking live or if you also have a video, just because we need a few minutes to find the video if you do have a video. Um, yeah, any other comments or questions? It's such a great platform and such a great, you know, I, I think it's wonderful how you're you're really using all the all the all the media opportunities to reach people where they're at and um, and making it accessible. So Jose, you've got a big grin on your face. Do you have a comment? Sorry, it's breakdown. I said you, you you have a big smile on your face. I wondered if you had a, a comment or if you could just say bravo. In the, in the, I'm feeling I'm feeling restricted by my lack of my lack of Portuguese uh, today in this session. Yeah, well, with Sylvia for sure. Uh, but we are the major you, you, the Portuguese. Uh, I, I had a similar question uh, that John put at, at your survey. <laughs> I, I, I had a similar question was just uh, how what is not not um, what is your plans for the future to actually improve the results? Okay. So uh, Jose just to make sure that, that the message okay. Jose, uh, thank you for watching our presentations from Sandra, Fran, and everybody, everybody else who is coming, who are coming. So let me tell you that you inspire me to, to do this survey because once many years ago in some airport we were talking and you make me a question. You ask it, uh, how do you, we know if they really understand about what we're, are we talking about? So because of your question, I decided to, to do this survey. And since then, I, I do this survey every, every year. Uh, last year, we we had uh, a, a grant to to create many materials, and we create we produced the books and videos and TikTok, and now in this year, from this year to be, to to next uh, actions, we are uh, doing many workshops with the teachers. For example, uh, Flavia Hughes, who is not uh, presenting with us now, uh, in, the, in her university, uh, she is uh, applying many uh, workshops. And Sandra is coming with me to make, to, to conduct a research about uh, our video games, because the video game is very, very, complex and we hope to understand how it works. And also we produce it as simulation and we are looking for a sponsor to 
translate our books and videos and because you know we translated some of our book our videos we have uh, around 50 videos translated to portuguese spanish and uh, sign languages okay rian sorry that's it that's okay i want to keep to keep listening but i also want to to uh, okay, move on to the next speaker so move the conversation into the chat there's no no one minds okay. if you keep typing to each other but it's just it's uh, this is a great time to plug the SCAR Action Group on Public Engagement with Antarctic Research as well, because you're big on your surveys and evaluations. So we'll put that in the link as well. Um, Sonia, you're looking like you're sharing your screen. Um, and I can't see. Have another go. Sonia, you're up. Hi, good morning. Good morning. You're you're on. Thank you for joining us. Ma'am, are you trying to share your screen? Uh, Sonia, está a tentar uh, a apresentação do Sonia, can you hear us? Are, are I, any... Hello, I, I'm, I'm hearing, but I, I'm not, uh, 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 I'm out of panel, <laughs> the panel. Yeah, we can, we can see you. Yeah. We can see you and we can hear you. So do you, okay. you feel free to share your screen if, if you have a presentation. Oh, I think Sonia disappeared from the yeah. screen. Yeah, maybe um, Laís, is that how I say your name? The, ne the, next, the next speaker? Are you, I can see your name. Hello. Yeah, Hi, it is Laís. Laís. Hey, would you, would, I realize that you're, you're a bit earlier, but would you feel happy to go now? And then if, if she joins us later, we can bring her back. Yeah, in. but do you have my video? I do not know that. Let's find out. I think okay. you have a video. Oh, and we don't from... have the video. Okay, okay. I think I sent you. I will try to. Okay. 
Uh, I think my, um, just a second. Okay, just a second. So Sorry, uh, we we have sent uh, three videos, mine, Sonia, and Laís. And you che check uh, with the SCAR team, and they said it's all, it was okay. So, uh, Flavia is sharing us the, the videos here in the chat. So, if you Sorry. can put the video, uh, it's uh, pre-recorded, the Sonia and Laís also. While, while we're doing a little technical pause, uh, Priscilla, you're our last speaker. Can I got Sonia's video know? already with me. Shall we go with that first? Oh, you've got yeah. Sonia's? Yes. Great. Let's roll with Sonia's, and that gives you some time to look for Laïs's. Thank Great. you. Good morning, participants of the SCAR 2022. My name is Sonia, and I will present. Formation of Environmental Education Teachers in Brazil, the role of Antarctica in the local climate. Our group consists of Vinícius Redigulo, Lúcia Canteri, Sonia Gretzner, Sandra Freiberg Afonso, Silvia Dota, and Flavia Santana Rios. Let's go. Brazil is mostly located in a tropical region, and the principal influence of Antarctic on climatic conditions is not always evident to the population, probably due to the absence of typical components of the cryosphere in the country. In order to contribute to the insertion of the team Earth is a System, in elementary schools, a workshop was conducted with school teachers from public, public schools. Investigative activities were applied based in problem solving scenarios and hypotheses, which were tested with simple lab experiments. An excerpt from the movie Titanic was used to create a context and thus think about the scenario. How do icebergs form? So, how do icebergs form? To test our hypothesis, the following materials are used. A hammer, a screwdriver, and a box with ice and rocks one on one side and water with some blue pigment on the other. Considering that most Brazilians have never seen a glacier, we simulated the fragmentation of ice blocks to understand the formation of icebergs and their displacement in the ocean. The buoyancy of icebergs was tested using different shapes and sizes of ice, prompting discussion about the physical chemical properties. What will happen to the ice floating under the water? A part is submerged and another is above, on the bottom, or floating on top of the water. Why is only part of the ice visible on the surface? How is this related to the dangers icebergs impose on navigation? Teachers also prepare salt water to see if the buoyancy is the same as in fresh water. To better understand the density properties, they also look at, at the behavior of ice in alcohol. Although very simple, the experiment simulated great interest from the teachers. Digital simulation iceberg 
demonstrates, demonstrates which position an iceberg is most likely to remain in the water. Oceanic and atmospheric circulation were simulated, inducing the formation of a convection cell in a container with a water at different temperatures and ink. Cold water flows downwards and hot water flows upwards. The ink makes the movement clear. Look here. The ice represented the Southern Ocean and hot water represented tropical regions. This demonstrates the importance of polar regions on the entire planet's climate and ocean currents. The educational game, Will It Rain? shows the role of air masses with emphasis on polar air masses from Antarctica on Brazil's weather and climate. This is summer, this is winter. The aim of the game is to cause rain in Brazil. Players earn points by answering questions about climate, atmosphere and the water cycle. Game points are converted into water, which fill clouds, which are emptied with into the city reservoir. Then water flows through a pipe to a house. Look here, the reservoir and the water flowing to a house. The applicability applicability of the activities and understanding of the concepts were evaluated using a survey. We asked, which concepts were really clear to you that you can say you really understood? So, in the response, so, from the results, 100% understood that icebergs are formed from the fragmentation of glaciers and that only about 10% of the volume is visible on the surface and that is why are a danger to navigation. The concepts related to salinity were not assimilated by most teachers. However, more than half of the teachers were able to understand the role of temperature in the movement of water. Most teachers, 84.6%, assimilated that the planet acts as an interconnected system and that different air masses cold, hot, wet, and dry influence Brazil's climate. Just over half, 61.5% understood that ocean temperature affects atmospheric temperature and that the polar regions are great climate coolers. Clearly, there was much more learning of the concepts in a practical and playful way in contrast to the theoretical approach. They were inspired by new ways of teaching. The activities were considered applica applicable with students aged 6 to 10 years old by the majority, 69.2%. All teachers said that they feel fully motivated to attend the next workshops on polar regions and climate change. So, thank for listening. I hope this generates interest, interest in climate change related to Antarctica. Good day for everyone.
Oh, that was just wonderful. I, I want to get my hands. I want to do those experiments now. Um, I'm not sure if Sonia came back though, from what I can see. Um, so maybe those of you who work with her can pass on our big um, thanks for a beautiful presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Lais and your video has been found. So I would like to ask the IT team. Yeah, great. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is Lais and today I will present a work about Antarctic annuals and the climate change. Card games for elementary school. Firstly, I would like to present all the people involved in this project. Lucas Paulo Fernandes, Melissa Estevam, Vinicius Mocelin, me, Laís Brito Ferreira, the professors Flávia Santana Hill and Sonia Grotzner, and the researchers Silvia Dota and Sandra Fons. Here are the institutions involved in this work. Universidade Federal do Paraná, Universidade Federal da BC Paulista, Interantar, and Science Interactiva. To start, it's necessary to understand that the human activities can affect the environmental balance of the planet, such as burning fossil fuels, industrial agriculture, and the impacts can be particularly noticed in the polar regions of the Earth, Antarctic and Arctic. Then, it's important to mention that there is a great biomass richness in the local fauna of this region, and it's composed of many endemic animals. Some representatives of this very particular fauna are seriously threatened by extinction, and some have already become extinct. So, the question, would climate change be responsible for the acceleration of this process? So. We know the answer and the environmental education has an essential role to prevent these problems. And thinking about this problem, we developed two educational games about this. So, the games expose elementary school students to polar fauna and many of their adaptations and extinction risks. The first one is the Zapinho Ambiental. In a playful way, the game addresses some ecological interactions and geography distribution of polar animals highlighting the trophic level, allowing the interpretation of role of each organism in the food web, as well as the environmental consequence of the eventual extinction of each one of them. So, here there are some cards from the games, and there are animals from different polar regions of the Earth. And some of them can live in both. For example, the whale, which stay in both regions, a penguin, which live just in Antarctic, and a parrot from Arctic. Then, there is a second game, Domino, Mudanças Climáticas Adapta ou Extingue. To play it, it's necessary to relate animals of Antarctic or Arctic with adaptive and evolutionary effects that allow the polar animals to survive in hostile and extreme environments. The rules are similar to a traditional domino game. However, players are invited to deepen their effect on the consequence of climate change on the adaptability of these organisms. And here there are some cards from Domino which shows the animals curiosity about their adaptation. For example, a fly that has no wings. And as we can see, both games and link the LO players in understanding of the characteristic of polar animals as adaptation that occur over time and that enable the survival of these species in polar regions. And also, it makes possible to understand the planet as a system through food webs that change according to the greater or lesser presence of an organism, focusing mainly on the issue of the climate change that greatly interferes with the balance of this ecosystem. Therefore, both games stimulate learning through investigative teaching, putting the student as protagonist of the process while also having fun. And all the games are freely available for download and printing on this website. So here are the game printed and the teacher can choose to use this game to start the class with this theme and then, as I already mentioned, deepen the content and even use the game as a basis for other activities. Thank you everyone for watching.
Thank you so much. That looks super fun. I want to play it. I want to get, mm -hmm. get my hands on it. Um, it seems that you're all working together the last few presentations. Do you, do you, does this collaboration, you know, people take the online course and they get the cards in their classroom and the teachers do the experiments. How, how does, how does that work? Um, it's kind of, we participate all about this team and we developed some games so we can use this game from um, to the teachers let me start again <laughs> okay um me and my partners who is biology students and the professors develop some a course about this and some workshops uh, which we develop some games and we can use this game from teachers that can use it to make some classes and use it from, uh, for elementary students. And I think it's part of collaboration who all the people are involved in this project. That's wonderful. So what is this? Are you all Antarctic scientists or educators or teachers or doing this for yeah. fun and you've got other there's, jobs <laughs> yeah there's like two professors two researchers and we are uh, biology students who would like to be a teacher so it's kind of i don't know like a, a big project that uh, can connect you all all of these people well, amazing. Well done to all of you, uh, not just to Lais. Really, I, I loved that all the presentations were together as well. Um, it was it was just really great to see how they all they all fit together. Are there any other questions from anyone? I'm going to keep an eye on the Q&A and the chat because I don't even know what where people are, are looking now. Um, I did see Angela, there was a question for Sonia in the Q&A, but I don't think she's with us, but maybe one of you who works with Sonia could, could pass that question on to her. What could be done for teachers to better understand the role of salinity? I wondered about that as well. That was a really interesting outcome of her, of her, of her study. Any questions? Well, I just would, would recommend that all of you give a group presentation in future as well, like a half hour with everybody, because it's, it's, I feel quite buzz, buzzy on that one now. Um, congratulations. Um, it would be wonderful if we could all be in a room right now playing those cards together. Um, Sylvia has, has said that Inter Antar program coordinates all these projects in Brazil. So big shout out to, to that program for doing great work. Uh, there's obviously a lot that, um, that those of us in other countries around the world can, can learn from. Um, yeah, very impressive. So we might move on to our last speaker and, and we're doing great on time and there might be a little bit of time for some wrap up and final reflections on the session. Is there anyone else in this? Zoom call in any role who has a comment because there's a little bit of time right now, a little bit of time um, to if anybody has a comment or a question. Okay, so I might invite Priscilla, who does have a video, but she's going to be beaming it from her own laptop, I understand. So why don't we see Priscilla and I forgot Hi. to ask the last two speakers where they were because I thought they were all in the same place. But where are you, Priscilla? I I am from Brazil, São Paulo too. Wow, it looks lovely and warm and daytimey where you are. Priscilla and I am a master's student in the graduate. Good morning. My name is Priscilla and I am a master's student in the graduate program in oceanography at the University of São Paulo, Brazil. Today, I will talk about the research I have been carrying out, polar literacy 
evaluation form to measure the knowledge of high school students about the polar regions. The intrinsic correlation between the development of sciences, sustainability, and scientific literacy is undeniable, and the boundaries between these areas are becoming increasingly tenuous, enhancing interdisciplinarity and the understanding of broader theories and technologies for the formation of a more ecologically correct, viable, and socially fairer planet. That said, it is important that there is a strong link between new research and a fast and effective communication of new and existing scientific knowledge to society, which today is a major challenge. In the field of oceanographic science, the ocean literacy movement was created in the United States in the 2000 years in order to spread fundamental concepts about the ocean, increase the ability to communicate about ocean concepts and be able to inform and be responsible for decisions about the ocean and its resources. Principles of ocean literacy are Earth has one big ocean with many features. The ocean and life in the ocean shape the features of Earth. The ocean is a major influence on weather and climate. The ocean makes Earth habitable. The ocean supports a great diversity of life and ecosystems. The ocean and humans are intrinsically interconnected. And the ocean is largely unexplored. Based on the development of ocean literacy, the so-called Polar literacy was developed and founded from the Polar Ice Interdisciplinary Coordinate Education Program, which aims to promote scientific knowledge about the poles and engage society in how polar regions influence everyday life and the climate of the entire planet. So, polar principles are the Arctic and Antarctica are unique regions due to their location on Earth. Ice is the dominant feature in the polar regions. The polar regions maintain a central role in regulating the Earth's climate. Polar regions have productive food webs. The poles are experienced suffering the effects of climate change at an accelerated pace. Humans are a part of the polar systems. The Arctic is a region culturally rich in history and the diversity of indigenous people. New technologies, sensors and tools are expanding scientists' abilities to study the land, ice, ocean, atmosphere and living creatures of the polar regions. Addresses the use of technologies to better understand the changes in the poles over the years. Based on the polar principles, I created an evaluation form to measure this knowledge of Brazilian high school students initially. The form has its cognitive demands to remember or recognize previously acquired knowledge, understand and understand the knowledge and make previous use of knowledge to solve complex problems involving polar literacy. During the production of the form, some questions were raised so that the form could achieve the objective of having an accessible language and that really fulfills its main objective of measuring the polar knowledge of a certain portion of the population. Then, issues related to accessibility were verified, keeping questions and answers option clear and objective, avoiding long, subjective or confusing sentences, and eliminating any redundancies, keeping the complexity of the language compatible with the audience in which the test will be applied, taking into account education and socioeconomic aspects. 
The format chosen for the test aimed the target audience that you answer. It was the format of selectable answers, presented in 2013 by Rodriguez and Haladina. The answers option are presented to the student containing only one answer option correct answer, three incorrect answers options, and one I don't know answer option. Therefore, a form was constructed containing 12 and 8 evaluative questions about polar literacy, with four questions for each principle described by McDonald et al. in 2020. So, the first question of the form in relation to the first principle of polar literacy, the Arctic and Antarctic regions are unique because of their location on Earth, is about the different characteristics between the Arctic and the Antarctic. The second question mentions the consequences of the tilt of the of the Earth's axis during the polar seasons, summer and winter. The third question covers the air temperature at the poles. And the fourth question concerns the distribution of terrestrial life in Antarctica and its limitation. Now, on the second polar principle, ice is the dominant feature of polar regions. The fifth question deals with the d dynamism of ice and salt water and the consequences of this interaction with the temperature found at the poles and with seawater itself. Also about ice dynamism, the sixth question is about icebergs, glaciers and ice shelves. And the seventh question addresses the movement of terrestrial ice sheets through, through the ground and the possibility of rock movement and erosion creations in the process. The eighth question deals with changes in air temperature and, and the consequence on expansion and shrinkage of sea ice and how climate change can accelerate this process. So let's move on to the third polar principle. Polar regions play a central role in regulation Earth's weather and climate. On this principle, I wrote questions about the stratification of ocean water. On the ref reflectivity of ice, snow, ocean and land, and on some expressive, specific terms related to polar culture, such as feedback and albedo. Within principle 4, polar regions have productive food webs. There are questions about life and change in ice cover and water temperature, about Antarctic food web, on diversity of land mammals in the Arctic and food web in the North Pole, and also about the displacement of marine and terrestrial predators at the poles and how this can be an indicator an indicator of climate change and interfere with food webs under principle 5 poles are experiencing the effects of climate change and at an accelerating rate there are questions around melting sea ice sea level about winter warming in the western Antarctic Peninsula on the consequences of the increase in level of rainfall and the salinity of ocean waters and the impact that this phenomenon can have on the marine ecosystems and on the sea level regulation. Now, the principle six, humans are part of polar system. The Arctic has a rich cultural history and diversity of indigenous people. Contains questions about human evidence at the North Pole on species migration due to climate change and how it affects human populations, on collaboration between indigenous people and scientists in understanding regional ecological cycles, and on the question, questionable extraction of Arctic natural resources. 
So finally, principle seven, new technologies, sensors and tools, as well as, as new applications of existing technologies are expanding scientists, scientists' abilities to study the land, ice, ocean, atmosphere, and living creatures of the polar regions, addresses the use of technologies to better understand the changes in the polar over the years, as well as how important human independent technologies are for polar research, about cosmic microwave background measurements, and about it takes many decades of data to look at the impact of climate change in the Arctic. The form containing the 12 and 8 questions plus a socioeconomic questionnaire will be submitted to public and private schools in all Brazilian states to be answered by students in the first and third years of high school. The results of this work will clearly show knowledge gaps by students in relation to the polls, and this will provide a more solid basis to work on scientific dissemination through other means that young people use to acquire information and entertainment. In addition, the results will also provide the information that students receive about the polar region, taking into account the teaching guidelines of Brazilian schools and what is outside this context, which can be used to complement teaching materials, for example. After all, public knowledge is essential for the implementation of ocean public policies, reiterating that all people must have access and awareness of decision-making involving environmental and marine issues. Thank you. Wow, that was a fantastic um, presentation to end on. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Um, I have a, a comment. Um, after to hear after we hear from others does anybody else have any any comments it was uh, oh yeah jose i have a small question congratulations priscilla and sylvia and all the brazilian team as a, as a it's impressive it's so nice work well done particularly for a thesis I just have a small question you mentioned that in your questionnaire there were between they were addressed to high school uh, students between the first and third years of high school. Was there a strategy? Why was that those years? And in practice, how old are they? So that we have an idea. Are they like 10, 13 years old or? Uh, uh. I will apply in the first year uh, and in the third year to analyze what they learn between these years too. So I will apply in the first years uh, for analyze that they learn about the polar regions until the, the first year and analyze the curriculum of high school uh, of Brazil. Okay, okay. Uh, one, one small question additionally. And after you do the survey and you know the results, uh, do you already have an idea what you're going to do with them afterwards? So, so we'll have some actions that can be implemented in those schools? I, I have no idea yet, but <laughs> I am an illustrator too. So I have some ideas to, to make uh, some books or materials for scientific, uh, scientific materials to spread the, the science, the polar science. Okay. Muito obrigado, Priscila. Parabéns. Thank you. Sil Sylvia, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, congratulations, Priscilla. Very nice uh, work. I, I would like to know if, if you can uh, send to us the reference about the polar literacy principles. Who uh, are, are created these principles and where can I, I can find the reference, please? All oh, right. Uh, the polar principles are created by the program Polarize is the website I will send the chat is polarice.com. It's a group of scientists in collaboration that create these principles. Thank you. So Thank my, you. my comment was um, looking at your in-depth survey, uh, one, it was really, amazing to see the content. Um, I imagine some people will want to replicate that in other countries as well um, or in other regions. Um, but also it, it, I made a quick reference to this earlier, but it actually really did this time make me think I should give a proper plug for everybody on this call for um, the SCAR Action Group, which is called PEAR, P-E-A-R. If Jose or Rebecca or anybody who's a member can put just the link to the SCAR website into the chat for the PEAR Action Group. That stands for Public Engagement with Antarctic Research, I think. But it's, it's a group for, of, for people who are interested in public engagement. Uh, it's, sorry, it's Public Engagement with Antarctic uh, Research. <laughs> so it's research about public engagement. And uh, your, your work would fit in very closely in there, but also anybody who's doing these activities and wants to find an opportunity to share them and write them up, that would be a really good community to join. It's, it's, um, it's your place in the SCAR community. Um, Jose, you, you're, you're like Mr. SCAR in the room here. Do you want to say anything about how SCAR works or, or, or the place of action groups? Sure, I can. Uh, I think the first the first message, especially if you're new to SCAR, is that SCAR it, it brings all the community together, and and is very open, and you are very welcome, everyone. So if you think you can contribute other into the science, into education, like pair in this group, this is ideal. Uh, one thing that we are very um, we totally promoted is contact people. You know, you saw Sylvia, you saw Francine, you've seen Sandra, you've seen uh, Rebecca, Rianne. These people, uh, John, we have, we have Laiz, we have such a, a, a very active group. And it's through these discussions and these conferences, and there'll be opportunities also for workshops that actually can promote and improve these connections. So it's one big, um, uh, shout out to say you're not alone and we work together scar is here for you and this work that we saw this morning by john and and all of you in brazil is truly inspiring and you're leading a lot of this work and also i'm sure you're inspiring a lot of other people to carry on your work so i'm really happy so if you can help anyway do join pair and other groups, others in terms of science of education. And John, John has also a message. John. Yeah, hi, hi guys. Um, uh, one thing just to offer, if any of the films are of interest to you and your work, um, uh, we do have, or we are developing Portuguese subtitles for everything. Um, and so, so if if it's interesting to you, please get in touch. I'd love I'd love to be able to to infuse your work with with some of uh, of the work that that I've been doing here. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. And I believe that the that Rebecca's about to step down from the role of of the chairing or whatever the role title is, uh, pair, but it's being taken up by two co leads. It's Elizabeth Lean and Katie. I can't hear you, Katie Rebecca. Marks. Katie Marks, thank you. Um, and, and they are just going to be starting in the next month or so, I guess. So it would be a great time to write to them and 
with ideas on what you would like it as, as a community. There is a list, sir. there's a, an email list which everybody can join and just share ideas and, um, and, and kind of build the community, especially these days when we're not yet able to meet in person, but hopefully one day we will be able to have one of these meetings in the same place. So um, it's 11 o'clock in my time. I don't know what it is in your time. Um, thank you all very much for joining. Um, I'd like to say a specific, uh, 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 a, a particular shout out to John, who I think gets the prize for the craziest hour. It's I think at 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. for him. Uh, for Rebecca and I, it's it's approaching 11 o'clock at, at midnight. Jose, it must be morningish, and and I guess in Brazil it's sort of afternoonish. At least I can see the some sunshine there. I really uh, would like to see where you are, Priscilla. I'm looking at your, I don't know if that's a photo or if you're actually outdoors, but the idea of being outdoors right now is not warm where I am. Um, I want to say thank you to the ITS team because you've been working really hard. We, we had some struggles in the session. To all the speakers, thank you very much. And especially thank you for keeping to time. I really appreciate that. It made my job very easy. To everybody in the room um, who joined and has been listening, Thank you also for flipping around between the technology while we were trying to figure out how to hear from you. And pair the Public Engagement with Antarctic Research Subcommittee or whatever they are, Action Group, and SCAR for making this possible. And finally, there's one more session. It's going to be on Wednesday at UTC 0500 to 0700. So it's it's a probably a, not a great time for some of you, but a better time for others. But all of these presentations are recorded. Today's are recorded and the ones in that session are recorded as well. They can be found on the SCAR website. And there's also a poster, an e-poster session that is related with this um, same topic. And you can navigate to that through the SCAR conference website. So I really encourage you to go and check out those posters um, in a little bit more relaxed time. Um, I think that's everything for me and thank you so much for joining. Thanks, everybody. Parabéns.